Welcome to Through the Bible with Les Feldman, a 30-minute walk through the scriptures, teaching in-depth Bible truths that change people's lives. Now, here's your host, Les Feldman. Okay, here we go. We've finally got everything going, and uh, for those in the studio, I guess you realize it sometimes has some technical problems, but for you out in television, you don't know that. And uh, so we just want to tell you that uh, we're just an informal Bible study, and uh, we're not associated with any group. We depend totally upon the gifts of God's people, and again, we are never cease to be amazed how the Lord supplies our every need. And uh, like we shared with someone visiting with us a while back, that most of our contributions are between 25 and 50. And we had just opened the mail, so I just grabbed a handful and I said, here, this just proves what I'm telling And fortunately, there wasn't anything in that handful of checks over $100. So that's where all of our contributions come from, and we do. We thank you from the depths of our heart. I don't care if it's only $5, and so many times folks will apologize. Don't ever apologize for not being able to give more because uh, we always have to think of the widow's might and how the Lord blessed that. Okay, now for those of you out in television, I've already got the studio audience. We're turning to Romans chapter 16 and we're going to look at verse 25. Now, we've left all this on the board purposely because for the last several programs we've been talking about the difference between the terminologies of the kingdom of God, the kingdom of heaven, and the body of Christ. Now those are all entities that are mentioned over and over in Scripture. And the body of Christ, of course, you won't find anywhere except in Paul's epistles. But it is part of the kingdom of God, and so we have put it in the large circle, which we have designated as the kingdom of God, the all-inclusive control of God over things that pertain to his righteousness. Now that won't include the lost, that won't include the hellfire, but everything that pertains to the righteous side of God is in the kingdom of God. In other words, the angelic hosts and uh, believers of every age were all part and parcel of the kingdom of God. And it will be that kingdom that carries on into all eternity. And that's why in Revelation it speaks so specifically of the wicked who are outside. They will never become part of the kingdom of God. All right, then as the weeks went by, we've been looking at the kingdom of heaven, which was specifically promised to the nation of Israel. And see, so you really don't have anything pertaining to the kingdom of heaven until after the Abrahamic covenant of Genesis chapter 12. And then it becomes specific when he starts dealing with King David. And in second uh, result, a genetic line of kings leading all the way up to the King of Kings, Jesus of Nazareth. And uh, then the whole purpose of his first coming was to present himself as the creator, God of the universe, but also as the promised Messiah, Redeemer, and King of Israel. And that's why it was kept only for the nation of Israel because he had nothing to do with the Gentiles who were outside of the covenant promises. Now, when Israel rejected all the things pertaining to the king and the kingdom, and we're going to look at that in just a minute, then God does something totally, totally different. And uh, the difference, of course, is delineated in what we call dispensations. And uh, we're going to also look at that this afternoon because you cannot get a comprehension of these various entities unless you understand the dispensational approach to Scripture. And if they throw out the dispensations, then all they can pick up in its place is mass confusion. All right, now here in Romans chapter 16 then, we see a statement that pertains to this particular dispensation of which you and I are present. Romans 16 verse 25 where the Apostle Paul writes, Now to him, speaking of Christ, that is of power. And of course, that was generated at resurrection power. All right, so now unto him, that is of power to establish you. Now that word isn't in there for nothing. What does that mean? That you know where you are spiritually. You're not driven about with every wind of doctrine. Everything that comes across television isn't something to just make you confused. You're set. You're a st 
established, see? All right, because of the power of Christ's resurrection power, he has established us according, Paul says, to my gospel. And what is Paul's gospel? Nothing concerning what Paul has done. It's all on what Christ has done. And here it is, the preaching of Jesus Christ according to the revelation of the mystery which was kept secret since the ages began. Now that's plain English. And why can't people understand it? I'll never know. But all of these revelations, these mysteries that Paul speaks about throughout his epistles were totally unknown all the way from eternity past until it was revealed to the Apostle Paul. Now, God knew it was all in his divine purposes, but he saw fit never to give any indication of this period of time that is concerning the body of Christ. Now, all of the Old Testament is full of prophecies concerning the kingdom of heaven, the kingdom of God, but it is totally silent when it comes to the body of Christ until we get here. And that's why Paul makes it so plain that it was kept secret since the ages began. Now, here's where I get in a quandary as to maybe define a, a dispensation before we go any further. And uh, I want you to move up to Ephesians chapter 1 because whenever I talk about these things that some people just almost get bent out of shape over, I have to show that it's a biblical term. And the first one is in Ephesians chapter 1. Because we're not just pulling words out of the woodwork. These are things that are part and parcel of the Word of God. It's a scriptural term. Ephesians chapter 1, dropping down to verse 10. Ephesians chapter 1, verse 10. where he says that in the dispensation of the fullness of time, in other words, the last dispensation of human history, which will be the thousand-year reign of Christ, which will again be the period of the kingdom of heaven on earth. That's going to be a final dispensation. All right, now then turn over to chapter 3 and drop down to verse 2, and we have the same word used again. Ephesians 3, verse 2. Now the apostle writes, If you have heard of the dispensation of the grace of God, which is given to me to you word. Now we have another reference like that in Colossians, and it's much the same thing, but we might as well use it, and that's in Colossians chapter 1. Now, a lot of this is repetition, but fortunately, I had a letter in the mail yesterday which always encourages me. And the lady wrote, she said, Les, when I was a young college student, my teachers would always tell me the only way you can learn something is to have it repeated seven times. But she said, I'm not even average, so I need more than seven times. <laughs> Well, that helps me because I sometimes feel a little guilty about spending too much time in repetition. But it is the only way that these things will all finally settle in where you can understand it. All right, Colossians chapter 1. And these are the verses we were using in our last program, coming all the way down to verse 24. Colossians 1, verse 24. Who now, speaking of himself, up in verse 23, Paul, a minister, who now rejoice in my sufferings for you and fill up that which is behind of the afflictions of Christ in my flesh. In other words, he's speaking of the trials and tribulations that he went through to get the gospel out to the then known world. All right, for the afflictions of Christ in my flesh for his body's sake, which is the church, the church which is his body, and that's the circle that we've got over here. Now again, you always have to understand that the word church doesn't always mean the same thing. It always means a called out assembly, 
but it doesn't always refer to the same assembly. We've got Israel in the wilderness, a church, and we've got the Jerusalem church of the uh, Jewish believers that Jesus was the Christ. It was a church. It was a called out assembly, but it wasn't the body of Christ. And then when we come to Paul's epistles, like here, then he speaks of the body, which is the church, or we are, again, a called out assembly, as we pointed out in our last tapings program, how that God is calling out of the Gentile world a people for his name. All right, back to verse 24 then again, and on into 25, whereof, Paul says, I am made a minister or a designated individual in God's service according to what? The dispensation of God which is given to me for you. And remember, he's writing to what kind of people? Gentiles. Gentiles. So this dispensation of the grace of God was the real outpouring of God's grace to the Gentile world. Now, it can also include some Jews, but for the most part, it's Gentile. Now, my pet definition of a dispensation is, as I've used it over and over, even on the program, I used it up in Minnesota several times. My pet description of a dispensation is when you have a prescription from your doctor and you take that piece of paper to the pharmacist, and the pharmacist fills that prescription. And that particular medication is put in a bottle or whatever. And on the outside, he puts directions. Directions. For what? How to handle what's been dispensed. Now, isn't that simple enough? And so you take that medicine home and you set it in your medicine cabinet, but the next day you grab one of your other bottles and you take the directions off of that and apply it to what you've just been given yesterday. Will that work? Most generally, no. Because you have to follow the distinct directions for that dispensation. Now, it's the same way scripturally. Back in the Garden of Eden, Adam and Eve were in a dispensation. They were under a set of directions. And what were those directions? Everything in the garden is yours, but don't eat of that tree. That was the direction. And that was their dispensation. Now, as soon as mankind goes against God's directions for that dispensation, just like you and I would probably get in trouble using the wrong directions on a medication, Adam and Eve got in trouble. And what happened? God expelled them. And that ended that perfect dispensation. And now they have a whole new set of directions again, which will carry on for hundreds of years until we get to still another one. Not always in this order, but the next thing that you're most aware of is the call of Abraham. Now, after 2,000 years of various dispensations and mankind is failing every one of them, God finally comes to a place that says, I'm going to do something totally different. Instead of dealing with the whole Adamic race, I'm going to bring one man to the fore. And out of that one man, I'm going to bring one little nation. And through that little nation, I am going to bring about the Word of God. I'm going to bring about the plan of salvation, a savior for mankind. And that dispensation, of course, worked into the giving of the law, which was another one, another set of directions. And so that set of dispension and, and directions lasted until the Apostle Paul. And so Israel was under all of the directions of law. And it was difficult because they were such complex directions. But when Israel rejected all of that, now God opens up a new dispensation, a new set of directions, a new set of responsibilities, and we call that the dispensation of the grace of God. All right, now that's what we're going to be looking at in at least the next few programs. What does it entail to be part and parcel of this dispensation of the grace of God? All these various mysteries that are going to be revealed through this apostle all become part of our directions for behavior 
in this dispensation. And to me, that's so simple. It's so easy to understand. And see, yet if you mix them all up, then you've got mass confusion. I think I used uh, this example maybe previously on the program. I think I used it a couple weeks ago in Minnesota. I remember several years ago, uh, I think it was Dallas Theological Seminary. One of the professors down there was explaining dispensation. And he used a little different tack. He said, the seminary has a catalog of courses offered for every school year. And they are designated as the catalog for 1990, 91, 92, 93, 94. Every school year has a particular catalog of the various courses being offered. Now he said, what would happen to a student if he would come up and try to enroll, and he's doing it on the basis of a year 2000 catalog, and it's now 2005. Well, he's five years behind the eight ball. See? So if you're going to be in agreement with your dispensational directions, you're going to use the catalog that is appropriate for the day that you're going to school. Now, all those are simple illustrations of how a biblical dispensation works. You have to obey the rules, see? All right, now then, let's go on for just a moment then in Paul's revelation of the mysteries, and let's go to one of the more obvious, again in Romans, Chapter 11, verse 25. Romans 11, verse 25. And it's a verse that I use fairly often. And it's designated as one of these mysteries or one of these secrets that make up the dispensation of the grace of God. Okay? Romans 11, verse 25. For, he says, I would not, brethren, that you should be ignorant of this, what? Mystery. See? Paul is pleading with his readers, whether it was then or whether it's now. Don't be ignorant of this which has been kept secret all the way from Adam until revealed to Paul. And that's what every mystery is that which has been hid in the mind of God till revealed to this apostle. All right, what's this mystery? That blindness, a spiritual blindness, has happened to Israel in part, in other words, it's not forever, but for a period of time until the fullness of the Gentiles is brought in. Now, why that kind of language? Well, again, remember, I'll reconstruct. All the way up through the Old Testament, God is dealing with Israel only, with a few exceptions, pleading with them to be ready for the Messiah, Redeemer, and King when He comes. Well, He came. Was Israel ready? No. No, they couldn't believe that He was that promised Messiah. And that was the whole crux of his ministry, to prove who he was. But Israel, in their unbelief, rejected him, called for his death, and we'll be looking at that later this afternoon. But through it all, you see, God is going to now open up a period of time that nothing in the Old Testament revealed, nothing in the four Gospels mentioned, nothing in the early chapters of Acts, nothing in the later books of of Peter, Jude, and Revelation, they never, never re referred to this secret period of time that we call the dispensation of grace. All right, so now then, when God set Israel aside, way back there in Acts chapter 8 and 9, not only did He set them aside, He put a spiritual blindness over their eyes so that they couldn't comprehend anything spiritual. And at the same time he did that to Israel, he sends this new apostle out into the Gentile world. And that's the big difference in Scripture. All right, now let's go back and pick that up a minute in the few moments we have left. And uh, we'll just run through this real quickly because we've done it over and over. But again, I'm going to take the young lady's advice and repeat and repeat and repeat. 
Come back to Matthew. Back to Matthew, because I have to use it in this order or it just doesn't make sense. And this is what I tell people when they call on the phone. How, they ask, can I show this to people? Well, you can't just jump into the middle of something. You've got to go back and build how all these things progressed. Otherwise, they'll never believe it. Matthew chapter 9, verse 35. <clears throat> Matthew 9, verse 35. Jesus' earthly ministry. Matthew 9, verse 35, And Jesus went about all the cities and villages, teaching in their synagogues. See, it's all Jewish. No churches mentioned here. Teaching in their synagogues, and he's preaching the gospel of the kingdom, whereas we call Paul's gospel the gospel of the grace of God. All right, so he's preaching the gospel of the kingdom, and in association with that, he heals every sickness and every disease among the people. That was part of it. Now, I'll go across the page, at least in my Bible, to chapter 10. Like I said, we're going to do this quickly. Matthew chapter 10, he has chosen the 12. Now you drop down to verse 5. These 12 Jesus sent forth and commanded them. And he said, Go not into the way of a Gentile, into any city of the Samaritans, who were half Jews, they were not true Gentiles, into any city of the Samaritans, enter you not, but, here were the instructions now in this dispensation of law and his appealing to the nation on his basis of a Messiah, but rather go to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. Now, how many Gentiles in the house of Israel? Well, none. None. So he's not going to the Gentile world. He's going to Israel and appealing them to accept the fact that he's that promised Messiah and King over which the kingdom of heaven will be on the earth. That's all he's pleading, to believe that he was that promised Messiah, but they would not. All right, now then I'd like to jump all the way over to Acts chapter 7, I think it is, where Stephen again, not even one of the 12, but he was one of the chosen men to wait on tables, as we say, in Acts chapter 7. And he goes through the whole Jewish history. We're not going to take time for that today. But he winds up his message to the leaders of Israel. The high priest is in their attendance. And let's just bring it all the way down to verse 47, because now you can pick up what you recognize as Israel's history, where Solomon builds the temple. That's where we're going to jump in. Now, all this is back in Israel's history. Acts 7, verse 47. Now, Stephen says, and this was stuff that they all knew. He's just proving that he knows what he's talking about. And he says, but Solomon built him a house. Howbeit the Most High, that is, the God of Israel, the God of our, our world today, Howbeit the Most High dwelleth not in temples made with hands, as saith the prophet, Heaven is my throne, and earth is my footstool. What house will you build me, saith the Lord, or what is the place of my rest? Hath not my hand made all these things? Now Stephen comes back, and he points the accusing finger at his listeners, and he says, You stiff neck uncircumcised in heart. In other words, they had no faith. Uncircumcised in heart and ears, you do always resist the Holy Ghost as your fathers, back in Old Testament time, as your fathers did, so do you. Which of the prophets have not your fathers persecuted and they have slain them who showed before the coming of the just one? In other words, when the Old Testament prophets would go to Israel 
and condemn their wicked lifestyles and plead for them to get spiritually right with God because their Messiah was coming, what would they do? They would kill them. One of the last ones was Jeremiah. But they didn't kill him, but the Babylonians found him down in a dungeon someplace. And that was how Israel treated the prophets. All right, Stephen is reminding them. Boy, he's putting them on a guilt trip, isn't he? Okay, now he says, Even which of the prophets have not your fathers persecuted, and they've slain, they killed them, who showed before the coming of the just one, of whom, speaking of the just one, you, the people listening to him, including the high priest, remember, you have been now the betrayers and murderers, you who have received the law, that is, the Mosaic law, of which they were so proud, you who have received the law by the disposition of angels, and you have not kept it. Boy, he's laying it on them, isn't he? And so when they heard these things, they were cut to the heart. They were convicted. Verse 55, And uh, he, being full of the Holy Spirit, looked up steadfast in heaven, saw the glory of God, saw Jesus standing on the right hand, and he said, Behold, I see the heavens open and the Son of Man, Jesus the Christ, standing on the right hand of God. And they cried out with a loud voice and stopped their ears, ran upon him with one accord, cast him out of the city, and stoned him, put him to death. And the witnesses laid down their clothes at a young man's feet whose name was Saul. Now we're introduced to the next major player on the stage of biblical history. Peter and the eleven are going to, over a few more years, fade away. This man is going to come to the ascendancy. All right, Saul of Tarsus. Now then, verse 1 of chapter 8. And see how this is all unfolding now? Day by day, month by month. Now verse 1 of chapter 8, And Saul, the next major player, and Saul was consenting unto his death. And at that time there was a great persecution against the assembly which is at Jerusalem. And devout men carried Stephen to his burial. And then look at the next one. As for Saul, Saul of Tarsus, he made havoc of the Jewish church and hailed men and women and put them into prison. Thank you for watching Through the Bible with Les Feldick. Through the Bible is a partner-supported ministry. If this program has been a help to your study of the scriptures and you'd like to see others enjoy the teaching, your support would be greatly appreciated. Write to us at Les Feldick Ministries, 30706 West Lona Valley Road, Kenta, Oklahoma, 74552 or call 1-800-369-7856. Remember, all programs are available in printed form, audio cassette, and videotape. Be sure to tune in next time to Through the Bible with Les Felding.